Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Okay, welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast. Isaac here. I've been outside all day working in the garden, all sunburnt and dirty, but uh, we got to put this episode out tomorrow. So uh, we're speaking with Stephen Taylor. And he is amazing. He wrote a book called A Humoral Herbal, A Practical Guide to the Western Energetic System of Health, Lifestyle, and Herbs. And it is an amazing book um, about the humoral system of medicine and how it intersects with herbalism. And this is like the the traditional system of energetics in the West. So if you're interested in herbalism, interested in energetics, uh, I highly recommend this book. And the publisher, Aeon Books, has given us a discount code for the listeners of the podcast. And it's HH20. HH20, which can be used on the website www.aonbooks.co.uk until May 31st. So, if you want to get this book, I and I recommend getting it. Uh, use that discount code and do it before ne- the end of next week, before May 31st. Okay. Next big announcement. So, if you haven't heard, we are having a in-person conference at our farm this summer. It's September 9th and 10th. Matthew Wood is going to be there. Kate Gilday is going to be there. Lisa Fazio, Zamboni Funk. It's going to be amazing. And early bird tickets are now available. They're only 150 bucks. Uh, it's a really good deal. And they're avail- going to be available at that price until like July. But there are limited spots. So there's only we're only selling 100 tickets to this event. So if you want to come, make sure you get a ticket as soon as possible. Because it's probably going to sell out. And it's going to be an amazing event. So really excited about that. The link for for that will be in the description along with the discount code uh, for the for Stephen's book. Now we're really excited about this episode. It's going to be an amazing episode. I'm sure you're going to love it. Uh, here we go. Today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we're honored to have Stephen Taylor. How are you today, Steve? Really well, thank you. Been enjoying the evolving springtime weather here in the UK. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're finally getting spring in central New York, and it's so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Stephen, you are a herbalist and an author. You've got a dispensary, and you grow herbs and have an herbal practice in Sussex. And you've written this book on the humoral herbal system, which we're really excited about. So our first question, usually, is what brought you to the plant path? Okay. Well, it- I didn't start with humoral medicine, <clears throat> but I think like lots of young people, I felt a strong connection with being in nature. I, I was brought up in London, but spent the summers in the countryside. So I kind of had a had a love, you know, I, I love the countryside, love trees, all that kind of stuff, rivers, sea. And then I also found it, I went through a period of my life where I wasn't living in London. I spent a bit of time where I had been sent away to a pretty tough you old-fashioned kind of boarding school that we have in in the UK where you it was it was a pretty tough place however it was surrounded by the most beautiful countryside Mm -hmm. and so it really became a place of protection a place of safety a place that I could escape to and then when I became an adult young adult and was free to go out into the world and do what I wanted to do I did a lot of traveling and I had a I had a passion to go to you know explore different places and wild places. I spent some time living in Spain, and one of the first journeys I did, and I did it with my partner Zoe, is we were traveling in South America, and we were in the Ecuadorian rainforests in in the Amazon region. And unfortunately, she got quite ill. She had a really bad case of diarrhea and dysentery, and we were in one of those you've probably never traveled in any developing country you've probably stayed in those kind of very very basic hostels that are for people who are traveling through lorry drivers loggers whoever it might be tin roof very very hot during the day cold at night very a water supply that was intermittent an hour a day cockroaches at night you know rats scuttling a lot I mean it was an awful place mm-hmm. and that's a, a terrible place also to be ill yeah. so however in those places you're probably aware you can go to the pharmacy and buy anything you know mm-hmm. you can buy the strongest drugs and medication and so I've been going back and forth to the pharmacy trying to get medicine to help her to stop her she had constant diarrhea very mm-hmm. very sick and nothing seemed to be helping 
Mm. And then one particular morning after she'd been quite ill for about three days or so, I went on a walk into the, following one of the tracks into the rainforest that I've followed before. And I mean, the rainforest at that point in the Ecuadorian Amazon is absolutely fantastic because it's where the Andes meet the Amazon. You get this incredible explosion of biodiversity. Beautiful. And one of the amazing things there were the, were the butterflies. I mean, absolutely incredible. And so I was, was, was going for a walk along this trail and was completely entranced by all of these butterflies. You know, every time you passed a puddle, they were just taking off uh, in a complete dream world like, like you are, which probably isn't such a good idea of walking through the rainforest as I then discovered because I suddenly stopped and something made me stop. And literally with my foot in the air, I looked down and at my feet on the path was the biggest snake I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> And it was on the path. Obviously, it was the morning, so it was it was you know the the tracks through the rainforest. It's the only place where you get sun, mm -hmm. so that's what, that's where they warm themselves up. And right, so yeah. it was it was basking in the sun, curled up. Literally, as I stopped, it 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 arose. It obviously was woken up by my the vibration in my feet, and it looked up at me, and I looked up down at it, and, and I was literally about to step on the thing. And both of us just stared at each other and then suddenly like you know with a with like a bull whip it just disappeared into the forest and i mean my heart was going and, and i thought no i just go back see what's going on with zoe it kind of freaked me out quite a bit so i i went straight back to to the to the to the village where she was and on my way into there i bumped into another traveler and so i had a quick chat to, to him as you do and I told him about my difficulty and Zoe being very unwell and the hostel we're in. He said, oh, no, there's a really good hostel you should go to. It's on the edge of the village and it's run by a local woman and it's got its own spring, clean water, clean beds, mosquito nets. You should take her there. Awesome. So it's a great idea. Took, immediately went there, found there was a room, went back to the hostel, literally carried her there because she was that oh. very, very weak. Took her in and, and, and the woman who ran the hostel she saw her and she said, you know, go and take her to bed. And I went and gathered all our luggage. And by the time I got back there, the woman came and knocked on our door and she had a glass. I mean, it wasn't dissimilar to this. Mm. And it was about full, maybe a little bit full of actually a very similar looking liquid. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, give her this. And I said, well, well what is it? And she said, it's plant juice. And, uh, and I said, get her to drink it. So, you know, I, I didn't really know anything about plant medicine at that point but I was going to willing to do everything and, and Zoe was just said, look here you go drink this and she drank it um, by that time it was the evening and we went to sleep and uh, during the night for the first night she had no need to get up and go to the toilet at all that was really great had a good night's sleep woke in the morning first thing she did she turned around and she said I'm really hungry what's for breakfast <laughs> wow uh, and it was just amazing and 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 she was she was you know ready to eat and and everything had it was just completely mind blowing and it wasn't as if at that point i said right i better go back and be a herbalist but then later on in in my life after doing a lot more traveling when a point came that i was settling down and really looking for a way to earn a, earn, earn a living but in a sustainable way with nature mm -hmm. i really didn't want to do you know I was educated i could have got any job and earned lots of money if i'd wanted to but i really felt that certainly having seen so much global destruction in all the countries I've traveled in I really wanted to put my energy into something that honored nature and yeah. worked with nature and would bring back a, a balance of some kind and I tried to get into conservation work but it was a bit of a closed shop and not a lot of opportunities there and a lot of it seemed to be going around cutting stuff down which, oh. <laughs> which I know you have to do that but I kind of didn't want to go around with the chainsaw all day yeah. you right. know so uh, so and then someone had been actually it was my it was Zoe's mother had been to the Chelsea flower show the big flower show we have every mm -hmm. year and she came back <clears throat> and she she put on the table a leaflet and she said oh I thought you might be interested in this and it was a leaflet from the National Institute of Medical Herbalists it's the main governing body in the UK of, of, of herbalists and has been around since 1864. Mm. And it spoke about training as a herbalist. And I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting. It yeah. sounds, you know, I by then was interested in plants, very interested, but it never kind of joined the dots. And so that's how I started training. And, and then from then on started to meet, obviously, practicing herbalists and 
during that time as well, there's a very, very lovely guy who lives in Wales, and you may have read some of his books. He's called Dylan Warren Davis. And he, he wrote a book back in the 90s, which was called The Hand Reveals. And it's recently been republished by Aeon Books. And it was an exploration of the ancient art of chiromancy, of hand reading. Nice. Yeah. And he's very much, was very much taking it from the medieval practice as it existed mm-hmm. and its interconnectedness with the her- hermetic tradition and the humoral tradition. And in that book was the first time I really read about humoral medicine. So sort a of lovely introductory chapter on the elements and the humours. And I then happened to go to a lecture that he was giving on Culpeper and herbs. Mm, and yeah. I read Culpeper and loved Culpeper. It was all a bit ar- archaic and interesting and, and oldie woldy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he said, does anyone understand what this ast- astrological stuff is all about in Culpeper? And everyone said, not really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he started to explain about how the governance of a plant was a way of giving you an indication, giving you a story about that herb that would mm-hmm. enable you to, to use that, that story as a jumping off point into the other stories that are presented by the cosmos. So whether that is a story of imbalance, whether that is a story of connection, whether that's a story of a sympathetic action within the body or an antipathetic action, it leads you into that through the use of planetary symbolism. And so that was really my starting off with really into humoral medicine through, through looking at planetary symbolism. And of course, Culpepper was an astrologer. He, he did his diagnosis through decumbiture. And there are some herbalists who, who use that practice. I, I use myself planetary symbolism a great, a, a large amount in my practice, but I don't do decumbiture charts as a form of diagnosis. I use other traditional diagnostic tools such as mm. particular tongue pulse but also just just physiognomy so looking at people listening to people mm. emotional explorations of how their humor <laughs> what humor they have because yeah. that is, is, is actually even Carl Pepper says that I actually really want to know someone's humor it's really coming from how they behave because their behavior is coming from the heart and the heart is where the soul resides. So you're looking at their emotional responses as the best guide to you know, identifying humoral strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I imagine, you know, different healers have different skills, inherent skills themselves and, and predispositions. So some who are maybe more emotionally intelligent can like read that from a person, but some people who are more rational they, the decumbiture is a lot more helpful because it's it's very rational <laughs> yeah and i think it's another really intriguing thing certainly when you look into humor, humor humoral medicine and you look into ancient healing practices that there is always this it's a bit like a yin and yang in a way it's a dynamic yeah. interaction yeah. between rational and non-rational it's a bit like we've got rational numbers in mathematics, haven't we, and non-rational numbers. So pi is a non-rational number. It's infinite and keeps going. And pi will do things that you can't do with a solid, finite, rational number. It, it's magical. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly the same that, that we've got ways. So, you know, in any traditional system of medicine, you go and train as a Tibetan herbalist. You spend 20 years as an apprentice before you start to actually, you know, work yourself. And that's all about learning remedy, recipe, learning about stories and myths and poems and learning about the eight different ways you can use the skin of an apricot. You know, I mean, it, it, that has to be learned. And, and, and we all have to do that. We have to know when to gather things, how to gather things, what's safe, what isn't, what dose. We need to we need that rational, solid, defined stuff. But that alone, and this is the interesting thing that where we've got this, this, this challenge with biomedicine, is that it's very two dimensional. Yeah. And it doesn't give a narrative. So if you've got someone with, you know, let's just say someone with, let's just say, inflammatory condition, mm-hmm. and all of your anti inflammatory herbs, and you go, oh, well, I'll give them this last. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then they come back the next week, it's not working. You go, oh, what should I give them now? Oh, I'll give them this last. And eventually you go through all 5,000 anti inflammatory herbs. Um, because that's the only way you can do it if you're working in that sort of very two dimensional, defined way of just sticking things in, in that very, very categor- categorical way. 
Yeah. yeah. You need yeah. some way of, of, of bringing in the non-rational, of bringing yeah. in the inspirational, of bringing in the, if you like, the story of the patient and the story of the herb and the story of the process of healing. Mm. And within humoral medicine, because it's like all of these traditional systems, the description of the cycles of nature, it's all about the, the, the cyclical way that, that the cosmos exists. Yeah. So disease is always seen as an excess, as one aspect of that cycle. So if it's an excess of heat and dryness of color, then that's a bit like an ex excess of the summer. Because the summer, mm. in the summer, we're more likely to get drought, aren't we? Mm. And when we get stuck in drought and that doesn't change and doesn't move on, then, then, then we have disease. Because naturally we all have heat, we all have cold and wet. It, it's part of the, 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 the daily cycle, the life cycle, the cycle of health and disease. So, so really humoral medicine is giving us that narrative. And it's telling us that if someone is stuck at this place, how do we respond to it? How do we respond to that particular excess? And often it's through looking at nature. And so at this time of year, you know, you're probably doing the same as here. We, we, we're looking at the, the lovely effect in, in this. This is just the end of what's, you know, we're in the crossover between the end of the winter, the phlegmatic wet cold season, moving into the sanguine period of the year, which is the air element, uh, warm and moist. So the warmth of the sun, now we pass the, uh, the equinox, the warmth returns. So we've got the wetness left over from the, the phlegm of the winter, the water of the winter. And now what's changed is the warmth. So it's cold and now it's warm. So now warm and, warm and moist, all evaporates, the water becomes air. So at this point in that transition, what does nature do? So nature helps that transition by all the nettles and the cleavers and the dandelion yeah. coming up. And they're, they're turning that cold, dampness through their vital heat into life again and turning it into life and vitality mm. and so traditionally of course we would have done that when we would have just eaten the nettles because that's that's what there was because we are part of that cycle yeah so when you see a person for instance the other interesting is the, the other herbs that you that we're also getting of course what do we see i mean we get the earliest of our some of our herbs are ones like alexander's come up here which is mm. a relative mm. of of angelica hot and dry we get i've got lots of ground ground ivy coming up which is you know a lovely a lovely warm and dry plant we've got yeah. all the mints coming up warm and dry we've so, got ramps ramps wild, wild leeks and i guess it ramsons would yeah, be coming yeah up. ramsons exactly another so, mars so, herb yeah <laughs> exactly so what we've got is, at this time of year as well as it it being if you like those herbs which are which are you know <clears throat> we think of as very cleansing we've also got these herbs which are also very warming <clears throat> because that helps us move from the cold wetness, the cold phlegmatic, into the warmth of the spring. And through that movement, of course, you clear that excess phlegm. And if you think of, of yeah, ramsons, you know, wild garlic, of course, what better for clearing thick, cold, congested phlegm? So those ones like ramsons, which are considered to have a martian, well, martian quality, of course, that's cutting, that's going to clear through phlegm. And of course, it's hot and it's dry, hot in the third degree. So that means it really brings heat in. Even possibly, it's verging on hot in the fourth degree. So if you put a put a bulb on your skin, you know, a clove on your skin, like cultivated garlic, it will blister. So that makes it hot yeah. in the fourth degree. Yeah. And whereas ground ground ivy, gently minty, warming, is warm in the first degree. Right. So and then again, if you look at ones like ground ivy, which is a which is a Venus herb associated with the phlegmatic humor, you can see the connection there. And the story of how it connects to clearing phlegm, whether that's from phlegmatic organs such as the lungs, the sinuses, the brain, even. So, so that the lovely thing about the humoral system is it's really just giving us a language that we can use. Yeah. And it, it's giving us the sort of the clear definition of that because. You know, we we all as Westerners we know about these words. They're they're part of our they're part mm -hmm. of our they're, they're part of our language, aren't they? They're part of our culture. They resonate with us already, and that 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 you know, especially if you into things like it to be like Shakespeare. Of course, the whole of Shakespeare is all it's all about the temperaments. It's wow. all about humours, and and this is so deeply embedded in our cultural way of seeing the world that we've already got all that language. Yeah. yeah. So you mean right. like people saying, "Mel," like I'm feeling very melancholy right. today, or yeah. like 
chill out or yeah know, yeah so chill out you know for instance the every organ has a natural temperament just like so so you know the the basis in in the humoral system it's very simple it has what's called the six uh sorry the seven naturals and they're just the main things that make make up us in the cosmos in in in, in the cosmos and the basis of that is the elements the four elements and then the next one the second the second natural is the temperaments of those elements okay so when you talk about temperament we're saying you know fire the, the element of fire is hot and dry and the organs that are hot and dry, so for instance, particularly the gallbladder, the, the seat of colour. Interestingly, the nose is thought to be hot and dry. The, the front of the brain, because it apprehends ideas. Mm. It distills ideas from this mass of sort of stuff, you know, it distills it, which is what heat does. Mm. So, so each organ, however, the natural temperament of the head, because it's out of the body, it's all very wet in there. Mm, yeah. <laughs> full of moisture. It's, it's a phlegmatic organ. Mm -hmm. so actually it works best when it's when it's cool calm and collected mm -hmm. and we know that if too much wind in the brain we have the ventricles of the brain a full of wind and the way that things move around is the idea that there's these, this wind of the brain and if it gets too excessive wind then are those herbs which are particularly good for calming that excess wind of the brain cowslip flowers particularly mm -hmm. very good chamomile does mm -hmm. the same what it does is it stops the windiness of the brain. Oh. But chamomile is a, is a sun herb. And so if yeah. the brain is too cold, and if you've got a head pain associated with excess cold, then chamomile is wonderful. And because the brain is naturally cold, a lot of head pain is often associated with cold conditions. So you think of rosemary, it's our traditional folk remedy for head pain, rosemary for memory. Yeah, right. it's a sun herb, so it's countering any excess coldness in the brain. Oh. As we get older, the last part of life, we're like winter. We're starting to get cold and damp. Mm -hmm. We get we get more puffy. Mm -hmm. uh, we get edema, mm -hmm. and so your brain also gets colder. It loses, you know, the 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 movement of the heat and warmth in it. Yeah. It's overwhelmed by the excess coldness that's now developed as we age, mm -hmm. and so the phlegmatic wet damp organs the lungs as well you know as you get older because you tend to get more lung problems oh, the yeah. the venous side of the heart of course the venous side associated with venous uh -huh. the watery side of the circulation the venous circulation we get varicose veins we get varicose ulcers we get edema associated with venous collapse mm -hmm. and that's because of all this excess phlegm in old age so of course rosemary prime sun herb warming and drying yeah. Uh, particularly is going to help to move it helps the heart helps the lungs particularly good herb we know for old people and for elders generally helps yeah. the brain warms yeah. it up gets us to bring the memories that sit in the back traditionally in the back of the brain which is associated with the earth humor the middle of the brain associated with the air humor and the liver because the liver chooses what is nourishing and gets rid of the waste our midbrain where the judgments are to make a good judgment, we choose what is a good thought, get rid of the dross. <laughs> yeah. The middle of the brain is associated with, with the liver and okay. Jupiter and the air element. A good Herbert, Herbert example of that would be great for the brain. Great for, yeah. Think about hyssop and associated with royalty and judgment. And, you know, they even gave Jesus on the cross hyssop, the, the, the vinegar on a, on a sprig of hyssop because it was a representative of his royal status of being the king, the divine guidance. Yeah, in the middle of the brain, that's what we need. We need the yeah. divine guidance. And yeah, it's purifying the dross too. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it's the, love, the thing I love about it. I mean, I love stories. And I think that the stories of medicine, the stories of herbs, the stories of people, they become this wonderful tapestry that we as practitioners have in a sense, we've become the weavers of that tapestry. People come with their threads. <laughs> the plants come with a thread. <laughs> the season comes with a thread. The patient comes with it, and we weave mm. it all together and make it all whole. That's our job. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 this is a bit, you know, the, the the humoral system for me is it's it's the you know if you're going to weave a tapestry, you have a pattern. Yeah, That's yeah. What it's right. Right. And this is like the, the traditional system of energetics in the West. It is, yeah. Yeah, so it evolved initially 
from the Hippocratic corpus with Hippocrates. It was then refined by the Roman physician Galen in the first century. And really what we have as that sort of model is really, it's, it's also known as Galenic medicine, because pretty much it was, you know, laid down by, by Galen, the structure that we use today. And then there was a period where a lot of that knowledge was lost within European culture. It, it was still held in, in, in Arabic culture and still in parts of the Middle East and, and North Africa. They still use only tip medicine, which is exactly the same as humoral. It is humoral medicine. And interestingly, I know I've got I've got friends from who come come from Iran, and they talk about how everyone knows the temperament of each food. You know, they know which food's cool and which warm and which dry and which moisten. That they, they just this stuff. They they, they they just it's still part of the common parlance. So you know, and and then what happened in 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 from the sort of twelfth to fourteenth century into Italy, the the teachings that were still held in the libraries in, in, in the Arabic world came into Europe. And, and then it was picked up within European philosophy, mysticism, and, and it became part of everything. It became part of the seven liberal arts, the, the, seven, the seven things that we had to learn to liberate ourselves from ignorance. And then we could become fully engaged as citizens within, within, within a culture. So that's really where it all comes from. And in our tradition, certainly in, in Europe, obviously there was a, a big, you know, when chemistry evolved and, and physicians became, became associated with, with the chemists and our apothecaries became chemists and started to use chemical medicines. And really Karl Pepper and Parkinson's herbal in the, written in the UK, I mean, they were pretty much the last herbals written before chemical medicine really started to be used widely at, 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 at the end of the 17th century. So we pretty much get the end of it with, with Culpepper and Parkinson. And then of course, what happened was also, there was a huge amount of medicine coming in from the New World. And, you know, if you were gonna to go to your chemist or apothecary, you weren't gonna pay them anything for nettles, were you? But if they, you know, had some exotic medicine that had come hundreds, you know, thousands, but it, I mean, that's what everyone wanted. Yeah, we yeah. want the sassafras. They want, they, exactly. They wanted all the exotic stuff and, and, and it could be charged for. Mm, and yeah. so the physicians would prescribe that because ah. they weren't going to prescribe what the wise women down the road. Right. Or <laughs> right. you may be giving you, no, no, no. Yep. Yeah, they, they, you went to them because you were, you know, you were the, 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 the cultured, the wealthy, the gentry, and that's who physicians were there for. Mm -hmm. And then what happened in, in the UK, we were first nation to get industrialised, and so the, the agricultural knowledge and wisdom that was still held in the countryside, although some of that still existed till quite recently in small pockets and, and stories and, and, and in people's memories, it very much has dissipated. And that started 250 years ago when we had the Enclosure Act. And so people lost common land. People were forced to move into the newly growing industrialized cities. And then what happened in the 1850s is botanic medicine came back from the States into the big industrial cities of the UK. And that really brought, and so that's why a lot of the Western herbal medicine that evolved in the UK, you know, we use a lot of herbs like KN and, and Echinacea and <laughs> yeah. all those ones, because that's, that's what had come back right, um, right. and was given to us as botanic medicine. And, and that, but of course, botanic medicine had taken what Culpepper and Parkinson had been doing here and had taken it there. So it kind of came back here. Yeah, it's just it was funny, refreshed. like, yeah. Yeah, and then we've too. got, you know, so we've still got, you know, I mean, I've known people who have been my patients. I was part of a project in the UK called the Ethnomedica Project, where we we're talking to elders. Most of them have passed on now, but ones who were born pre, you know, during the wars, between the two wars, and we're still being brought up in households that were using country medicines. And so that knowledge still is existent to some degree, but it's very, very fragmented now. But a lot of it has been recorded. And, you know, medicine's a living and dynamic thing. And of course, True. as we practice as, as practitioners, as we have patients, they come and you know, give them something, they come back and tell us something about it. We didn't even know how we learned most of our stuff, isn't it? So, so yeah. you know, we're, we're all part of this river 
of 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 you know it's the it's the river of nature, isn't it? Mm. Flowing flowing through the cosmos, and we're all we're all in it together with the plants and the animals, and 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 you know the humoral story is just just a song sung about that about that river. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Now we're living in this very interconnected, globalized world where traditions from all from all these different cultures are now cross pollinating, too, and. And when you find a system like now, I'm studying Vedic astrology right now, and it's making me see the Western astrology that I have been studying in a whole different light. And we have like TCM practitioners and so, and so on, and, and they have more kind of in more consistent, holistic, in, integrated approaches, which draw a lot of people from the West too, because they, yeah. it seems so, so coherent. But that that also does exist in, in with with the humoral medicine, with the medical astrology, and so on. But yeah. it yeah, I think you're right, and I think for me it felt like you know I was lucky that I met the teachers I did. I had a very good yeah. mentor who's known as Christopher Headley. His 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 writings. Fortunately, he he passed on a few years ago, but posthumously his writings are being published by Aeon Books in the UK. Should be coming out next month. And a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Um, and he really held the humoral tradition for us UK herbalists very, very strongly. Um, awesome. And it, it felt that we needed, we needed to regain our confidence to talk about these things from a place of understanding and practice. And you can't just take that and use it. You have to practice it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, the way I having met Dylan I, I bizarrely actually started writing my book a long time ago in on the island of Kos which is where Hippocrates came yeah. away I've like, actually just gone on a family holiday we just got a package holiday with the kids or whatever we've just gone there mm-hmm. uh, I had taken the the copy of the complete Culpepper which has the London dispensary which is all the Culpepper stuff it's a, a big fat book you know there's lots mm-hmm. of secondhand copies around you can pick up yeah um, and, and I'd taken that with me. I'd just literally thrown it at the last minute. And while I was there, I visited the Asclepian, which of course was amazing. But, but also I happened to decide I was going to learn, oh, what's it? You know, uh, windsurfing, that's right. Windsurfing. <laughs> so I was windsurfing. So I was in the sea, threw myself in the sea, and I cut my ankle. Uh-huh. And it quickly became infected. Uh-huh. And so I couldn't do anything apart from lie on a sun lounger with my, with my leg up. So I need. I had to do something, and so there I was on 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 Kos, the home of of Hippocrates, with this book basically with Gulp. I said, okay, well now I'm really going to get to grips with what is all this phlegmatic and humoral and melancholic. I've used these words a lot, and I would use them in my practice, but do I really understand them? And I thought, well, no, actually, they're just you know, what is an element? What is what are we talking about? Spirits, you know, we we all use these words, and so oh, I'm really spiritual. What, what do we mean? You know, there's a very, very distinct way of using this language that's that, that if we know what we're all talking about, we don't get in a muddle. Mm. Yeah, um, we right, can discuss right. that. We can discuss what we think about the vital spirit or or the natural spirit or the virtues of the body or whether, you know, we're, you know the stomach and its temperament. Or what. We can discuss it if we understand what we're talking about, getting back to that rational thing. Yeah. And so I was, I was confined to... Uh, to recovering with my foot up for a week and 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 I just read it and and started to pick all this stuff up and started to write my and at that point I just knew I've got to write this has to be I needed a book to read that would explain it for me uh-huh. there is a very good book that you might still get I think it's out of print called Culpepper's Medicine by a chap called Graham Tobin you mm-hmm. might have come across it. it's a very very good book it's very academic and for a practitioner it, it's 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 quite heavy going to turn it just into practice because Graham's a fantastic academician and he talks about it from really the academic exploration of of the of the system and I really felt someone who was using it and could use it in their practice should be able to then put flesh on the bones mm. and also you know I mean we have a lot of opportunities. I've been to the States. I had an opportunity to join a Sundance in, 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 in the States. I spent a lot of time in Africa where I spent time with traditional healers. And so I was able to directly experience healing rituals in cultures, which mm. were still practicing them as they'd always been practiced. Yeah. And as far as I can understand, I think it 
for, for, from piecing things together. I think those rituals, certainly the rituals I experienced in Africa were very, very similar to the kinds of healing rituals that would have been practiced in the Asclepian temples of, of ancient Greece and, and yeah. all over Europe, actually, they, they spread. That's a very important point. And it's also amazing that you were on Kos, that, because that's where Hippocrates started at school, but also that's, I think, where the first astrological school was founded by Barosus, the Mesopotamian Babylonian astrologer in like 200 BC or so. Yes. So <laughs> it's like yeah. that, that, that island. It's, it's one of those nodes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, total mode. Maybe you're stuck there and something happens. It spits you right. out. Right. Go okay. do that hell. You're reading Culpepper, who's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> But so cool. in the West, herbalism has been so, like with the advent of chemical medicine and with the advent of the medical industrial complex and the, I mean, you know, herbalists were persecuted, prosecuted and gotten rid of in yeah. much of the US for multiple generations. But we, we, we look at things in terms of medical industrial ideas and in terms of rationalism, in terms of material reductionism yeah. and that's oh, so those other things the astrology the rituals which are in an in, incredibly important part of a coherent system are not valued they're not valued and they're not they're, they don't oh, exist no. and that's no. i think one of the reasons why people want to go to tcm or ayurveda mm. or yeah. you know yeah but, and of course yeah, i think you're quite and, and what often happens is people finish their training and they try this and they try it. And, and I found it sort of literally after about a couple of years, I kind of forgot most of what I'd learned. And that, like, what am I going to do? Am I just going to now reread all of my notes and just go back to where I was? Am I just going to spend my whole time on a computer? Well, we didn't have computers when I, am I going to try and sign up to a thousand journals? And, and is that the way that I'm going to feed my practice? Or am I going to do, because it's clear that, you know, everything we know in the way we are using herbs, we, we know that that's a, those are ancient uses. What mm -hmm. we read about in Culpepper, Parkinson, Dioscorides, it's the same. And what we're discovering biomedically is confirmation, a biomedical pharmacokinetic justification. It's just a, just a, it's a, it's a Western biomedical story about that herb, just like the humoral stories about that herb, but they're saying the same thing. But to access the biomedical story, you have to depend on someone else to do that research. So if we can go back to embracing the way of gaining wisdom that the ancient, our ancients did, and if we can make that our own as well, then we have direct access. Right. But right. like them, they did have their, their rational aspect mm -hmm. of it. Like yeah. we've got our rational, we've got the pharmacology, we can say no, that don't eat that, that's poisonous or whatever it is. Well, or we understand why that's doing that now. We yeah. understand why medicinal mushrooms are doing X, Y, and Z. We understand about the beta glucans. Great. Yeah. yeah. And that's great. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it's great. And we yeah. have that. But if we have that alone, we're it's a bit like what happened, you know, the, the, there's some very interesting books written by people like Peter Kingsley, you may have read, who talks about the Neoplatonists. Yeah. And how really from that point onwards, what happened was that instead of experiencing consciousness directly, as people still do in the East with meditation and those, those kinds of practices, we started actually just talking about it. And uh -huh. so within philosophy didn't become the love of the goddess Philo Sophia, the love of the goddess Sophia, heart-led, emotional, experiential thing. It, it became an intellectual discussion about that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and totally. it remained so for two thousand years. Mm. So we and and we, we we have inherited that as a as a sort of cultural stance, and also throughout that time, of course, you could say that's been linked up with the with with the growing strength of patriarchal hierarchical structures within culture within Western culture. And when we look back at the ancient healing traditions, of course, and pre diascorides and pre the ancient Greeks, of course, all of this came was being practiced by the many different peoples that lived in, have lived all over the Eurasian continent. And what then became formalized by Galen, you know, the, we know 
from, from ancient archaeology that all of these concepts, concepts of, of night and day, sun and moon, movement of tides, seasons, plants, tree of life, all of this, this is ancient, ancient stuff. This is, yeah. this is not just something that was owned by Galen and Hippocrates. They, they talked about it as Greeks, as ancient Greeks coming from their quite patriarchal and hierarchical perspective. Right, they formulate it in their language at that, from their time, but it, what, like the tree of life exists, I mean, it exists in, in Taoism, it exists in ancient Assyria, it's, yeah. Even, of course it does, and, and interestingly, even within Greek medicine, when you look at the Asclepian healing temples, they couldn't expunge the feminine and the sacred feminine, and so the, the healing god Asclepius, he, he always is used in the rituals with his daughter Hygieia, who is also in a mystery of the healing, she is a healing deity in her own right. Mm -hmm. And the Greeks still recognize, although that they were very, a very patriarchal culture and the Greek Olympian gods had taken over from the pre-existent feminine earth mother goddess, the triple goddess of Europe, they couldn't expunge her. And so she continued to exist within the rituals and within the symbolism and within the practices just the Greeks weren't going to accept it and talk about it and, and give it authority <laughs> they didn't have you know what I mean it hasn't got a beard it hasn't got authority however you you, know, you look at actually the way that things were being practiced it, it, it was still and again you know the feminine is so much associated with the non-rational mm -hmm. with the dreaming and you know so 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 the healing process would often you know would complete with a visit to the healing to the abaton which was the dream temple and in that place, you would hope to get a healing dream, which was oh, a final catharsis yeah. and clearance through a, through a non-rational experience of the healing process. So in a, a bit like, you know, you had this rational process of application of herbs to, to prepare for the non-rational experience of, of going into the, the becoming entranced within the abaton and within the healing dream, going through a process of the non-rational process of, of catharsis and healing. And again, it's interesting because when you think about, and in, and in humoral medicine, we also use things, things like using forms of catharsis, such as vomiting, you know, purging, all of these kinds of things. You know, these are non-rational things. We're not, it's not something we're rationally doing. It's our body. It's, you know, the same as singing and dancing and getting into ecstatics and they're non-rational. And these are the things which were always used to give the completion to the healing process. So, yeah, I mean, the lovely thing is that we, we from where we stand, we're not entrenched within our rational reductionist Western viewpoint. And this wonderful internet has enabled us to, you know, further extend our web of wisdom, which, which you know, is, is, is like nature. It will happen, any plants will grow everywhere. We, 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 nature will just spring up even in the internet. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, not, we're not separate from nature, you know? Yes. It's, yeah. yeah, we're, we're the weeds we're, of the internet, aren't we? Yeah, and the internet's made out of minerals and, uh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's a flowering of the mineral world. Mm -hmm. and, but that, that the dream incubation is so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I had heard of this, you know, studying ancient classical culture, but it I didn't realize how important it was as part of the healing journey. It's like the you're saying it's, it's really like the culmination and the catharsis, and it is that it's that non-rational, and in a lot of ways, it's similar to what like in the Amazon you'd be doing a dieta and then doing, you know, drinking the ayahuasca and so on. It's, it's kind of a Western equivalent, equivalent exactly. of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, 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 it's interesting because when you go into a ritual, a group ritual state, so in Africa in a ritual state, everyone in that ritual is entering a trance state. So when you have a ritual and you have, you know, you, it, 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 it's all, it's done traditionally. So it comes from the idea that these, the, these four, four circles, the inner circle is the hearth, is the ancestors of the home, the circle around it are the diviners who are dancing around the hearth, the circle around that are all of the people who've been called to join the ceremony and they've all brought their ancestral energy and they stay, they sit in the circle and they sing and clap and, and together and then finally it's all encased in the circle of the hut. So it's got these four circles which are the four, like the four elements and the four traditional groupings of ancestors. And together mm -hmm. they bring healing. But within wow. that, held within that, everyone is in a trance. Mm -hmm. So if people are sitting in the outer circle and the divine is in the middle who are working themselves into a trance to bring the voice of the ancestors through, 
if the people in the in sitting around the walls are not singing and are not clapping they they I've seen it they, 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 they're going out of there shaking they say wake up clap sing this is medicine <laughs> you know you can't be here just looking at the ceiling <laughs> clap you know because it's everyone becomes this this ritual trance and so the, the healing rituals of that kind of course that's exactly what happened in the greek healing temples and in in the abaton this is what it's, it's very so you know it's it's pretty clear that's what was going on it's it's a yeah. healing ritual and it's the whole community being healed it yeah. is into everyone everyone benefits and, and and indigenous medicine and indigenous culture has always been like that it's always about reciprocation i'll feed you you yeah. bring your ancestors come to my come to i want them most powerful ritual i want 300 people here well i better provide food and drink for 300 people and then they'll come mm. if they come wow there's going to be and it, you, you know the power of 300 people backed into a small hut i mean they'll try <laughs> wow <laughs> you know yeah. the power of that is immense you know we know that the, the the power of, of of you know group energy yeah, yeah. We know that power. You go to an amazing gig and everyone's jumping together, <laughs> singing together. And there's this, it takes over. And, and they understood that and, and, and they, they knew how to use that because that is the ancient way of humans. Mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult for us to do as individuals in our little consulting rooms, but we can still try and still sing with yeah. our page. Do you, yeah, how do you incorporate dreams or, or ritual into your practice? It's, it, it, it really depends a, on the patient because it's all about the patient and where, where they're where they're coming but for me because i've also trained in africa with some patients i may even do do traditional african divination which is not really part of humoral medicine but i will often use i'll often use physical medicine such as steams i may do vomits that's quite not uncommon in Africa, there's a lot of vomiting that's used. A lot of, you know, the medicines very much are about protection and catharsis. So it's all about red medicines and, and blue medicines. One's about cleansing and one's about strengthening and protecting. And so we, in Africa, I learned a lot about how to do vomits safely and effectively. So, so I do use those. And, you know, often, I mean, I do, I do body work as well. So, which is really helpful again within the sleeping tradition, within humoral medicine, of course, within the healing temples, there would have been gymnasia, there would have been baths, there would have been a, a massage, there would have been all of that going on, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, I, I do use body work as well. So I use oils, infused oils and things as part of that. I also use rattles. That's again, something that mm. I, you know, we know from the Native American tradition, other traditions. In Africa, rattles are used a lot. So I use them often as part of a way of, of, of removing the static that builds up around our, or you know, our energy will, yeah. Yeah, right. Away and they're open and, you know, so I might use that as part of a bodywork treatment. Oh. So, you know, I'm very eclectic in the way I work mm. and it's from, you know, we have this opportunity, we, 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 we've had the opportunity to travel, we've had the opportunity to do internet. We, we've learned a lot of stuff and, and, you know, after we've done that for a few decades, hopefully we, we've, got enough, we've got enough tools and we should be using them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of the, the importance of this is to find is find the how they all work together and the coherence and the integration yeah. of them all. And that's one of the things I'm I'm learning by studying Vedic astrology is how like the template. Like, because for instance, you wouldn't be using Ifa in humoral medicine, but you might be using geomancy, which is related you know, or you'd be using decoverture or so on. Like there is divination, like there's a divination component. There's like the, yeah. the actual physical medicine. There's the ritual. There's, you know, there's all these components that they work together. And you can, in this age where we can access all these different techniques from all these different cultures, yeah. you maybe you know, we'll be using different ones from different cultures, but mm -hmm. having a framework for putting it all together is yeah, I, really important. Yeah, I think it's the, the, it gives us, it, 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 I mean, Christopher Headley said to me, he said, none of this has got to, you know, it's, it doesn't help your patients. So it helps is you. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what you think. They want to get better. It's, it's yeah. you that it's about. It helps you. Yeah. Um, and, and in humoral medicine, probably the most important form of diagnosis is actually 
the, the empathetic understanding of where your patient is, mm -hmm. because that will, that, will event, that will really pin down what is going on with them humorally. And, and because we, we live in cultures that tell us to be this way and that way, and we're, we're, we, we, we grow up learning how to be in the world, and, and, and we, we wear all these masks and our patients do too. But emotionally, that's something that even, even in the most masked person, <laughs> the emotions will escape. Yeah. <laughs> the best. Especially when they're in a, a place of, of illness or when they've yeah. got something wrong, yeah. I mean, choleric people hate talking about sickness. They hate being sick. They yeah. always fight it and deny it and run away from it and forget that they're ever ill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but even, even that, seeing someone like that immediately show, tells you something deeply about their, their emotional states and the way they deal with the world. And that is more important than tongue diagnosis, pulse, pulse diagnosis, blood tests. It's more important than anything. Mm -hmm. if, if you can get that, you, 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 you've got everything really. So it all goes back to being human and, and relating to each other as humans and, and to our human story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Spoke first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's beautiful too, because there are a lot, of, a lot of healers who have not been so educated on all these things, but it, they, they've had the compassion and the empathy and that's what's that's the most important thing. Yeah, it is. It's there in all of us. You don't have to go to the Amazon or to Africa or anywhere. It's here. Mm -hmm. And those of us who've had those opportunities can come back and say, oh, I went all that way. And I'll tell you, it's here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just had to go there for 10 years and spend all my life savings on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't have to. You've already got it. Mm, yeah, Maybe we need to do that so we can tell people oh, this is, you're doing it. Kind of reminds me of like the, the chemist back in the day who wouldn't prescribe nettle, nettle but it's already yeah. there right down the road. And sometimes it's just, yeah. you need some nettle. <laughs> the plants, you don't have to go to the Amazon to talk to the plants. Talk to them, they're outside your window. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, that, that's the thing, isn't it? And it's it's giving, because people do think, you know, we are a basis, a, a big element of our culture is about acquisition. It's yeah. knowledge of status mm -hmm. and experiences mm -hmm. and we think oh no i'm not big enough i'm not strong enough so i'm acquired enough because that's how we're supposed to grow we grow the constant shape. state of growth just yeah. Up, up, yeah yeah we don't grow as in us growing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We grow by piling more and more stuff on us mm -hmm. so so you know we come from that culture and we all think oh no i'm not i'm not competent <laughs> I haven't acquired enough certificates to put on my wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. You know what I mean? We always feel we're one course short. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but at the same time, like a traditional healer would also be apprenticing with a master for 20 years. Yeah, of course. And so at that at that point, and, and that's one of the things we don't have as much anymore, is that like yeah. really long-term apprenticeship. Or um, like the lineage of like the grandmother grandfather passing it down to their children and grandchildren like yeah. there's yeah. been some some breaks yeah. in that lineage yeah. of like traditional knowledge and healing yeah. and plant knowledge being passed down in families yeah it really reminds me i'll, I'll tell you a little bit story about about christopher he mm -hmm. visited the states and canada and i was given after he died i was given something of his and i didn't actually know what it was a little pot mm -hmm. and in the pot i opened it and it was full of feathers Mm. And I looked at these feathers and they were like little, they were like the down feathers. They were very, very soft and lovely. And, and I just thought, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> and then at a point later on, I was looking at it again and inside there was a little bit of birch bark. You know how you can put it off paper. And he had written on it, vulture. Ooh. Oh. So they were the feathers he'd collected from a, from a vulture. Wow. And immediately I understood something very profound that he was directly telling us that he his he he's like he was like a vulture. Uh-huh. He flew around, he saw everything. Mm -hmm. And from all that had died before, he took nourishment mm -hmm. and then fed us his chicks. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Was they talking about it. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Mm. So yeah, we this is what we are. We're the vultures for the future generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're producing this lineage. We're reviving it. 
and remembering it and putting it back together. Yeah, and I think this book is a really helpful addition to this work because, you know, people hear the word melancholy, people hear the word choleric, um, and they kind of know what it is, but there haven't, as far as I know, there haven't been books that really explain how it all fits together yeah. in a long yeah. time. And yeah. not everyone's going to pick up Culpepper. <laughs> yeah. And, and that doesn't yeah, even that, explain it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was the book that I felt I needed when I started practicing. Mm -hmm. So I felt that having had the opportunity to develop a practice like that, I really needed to provide that. It was a bit like, you know, the, all those teachers, the gifts that have been given to us you know, as I said, given the things I'd learned to me so that I could then put it together in this format. And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of very practical stuff. So, you know, I, I like thinking in in the way things network and fix together. So I've done a lot of things. If you've looked at the things like flow charts that show that, that if you're a melancholic person, how are you likely to go out of balance and what are the signs of that? What are mm. the symptoms? How do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. How do you clear it? And so for each of the different humoral presentations, the different kinds of temperamental presentations, the melancholics we have, the phlegmatics we have, mm -hmm. the sanguines and the cholerics we have, there's a, there's a specific way they're likely to go out of balance. And so providing a viewpoint of that in a very, very clear formed way to think, oh, OK, this is what happens to cholerics when they get too choleric. Oh. Can you give us some examples? Like, of how using... manifest. Oh, and this is what I should do. So I try to just give that, and it's not, yeah. it's not a dogma. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, it's a description of, of, of how I've worked with it and how I found it to work practically, but it comes from this tradition. Mm -hmm. so, so helpful. It's for everyone to work with that, and the main thing you're very free to completely disagree with it. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a much more interesting conversation with people when they when we do, when we have when we bring in our different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. That's how it's always been. Yeah. Yeah. So what what would an example of like say a choleric person look like out of balance and some things that they could do to go into balance just to use well, it's a, good, a, a, good, a good a good example often, you know, a very hot skin conditions are going to be quite common in choleric people. I recently had a 60-year-old man. He'd been in the Navy. He was a, he was a, he'd risen high up. He'd been, I don't know, whatever they become in the Navy and he'd <laughs> done it with life and he loved sailing and, you know, because he liked to take on nature and win and everything was very clear. He's very forthright, yeah. uh, upright, you know, very, very Martian, very, very militaristic, very choleric. Yeah. Lovely guy, generous, clear, a good leader. Mm -hmm. uh, protection protective very protective of people is from you know wonderful person great choleric but yeah you don't want to get an argument with him <laughs> he'll, never, he'll, never give, he'll never, never give any ground <laughs> yeah and he, he presented with rosacea okay uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so and I look we, we talked about various things and obviously I you know looking at his diet and you know his breakfast included a nice big glass of orange juice but a sugar of course which is gonna mm. add heat sugar's a bit like petrol produces lots of heat immediately and then makes us cold right. so we started went through all the diet and you know tried to cut out excess alcohol sugars all of the things that you would normally do to get rid of the, all those heating and drying things in his diet mm -hmm. and um, and then I gave him some bitters obviously that's you always give bitters to to cholerics mm -hmm. uh, Tibetan herbalist told me once that apparently the one thing they say is once you've done all your training, they then say to you, if you don't know what's going on with your patient, give them gentian. Ah, yeah. If they don't get better, you'll know that the cause of their disease is not heat. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so anyway, I gave him gentian and, and I gave him some nice, you know, general cleansing teas, the ones I would use for the state of, of moving people through fevers. So they're, they're those warming herb, herbs warming in the first degree, or well, our fever herbs. So ones like elderflower, yarrow, lime blossom, chamomile. So gave that as a tea. I was like to give teas, particularly when drink treating the skin. Mm. Culpepper said that anything associated with passages and the skin, because passages are lined with skin, skin is associated with the passages. You use you want to use teas and decoctions. They go quickly in and quickly out. So so always give teas, and he did very well actually. Things were way way better. And then I saw him in the, about four or five months later, that was in the summer, 
and he came back in February and everything was terrible. He was in the middle of the winter. Why is a caloric terrible? And of course, the way that when you think of the energetics and the movement of things is that in the winter, as everything cools down, we're much more likely to get cold congestion. Mm -hmm. And because calerics, because they're always overdoing things and overheating, mm -hmm. they get left with a lot of debris left behind. Oh. You know, and, and we, we know, for instance, you know, we're now using words like amyloid, aren't we, which we know is debris left behind after inflammation in the brain. This is the old word for it. They used to call it atrobilis or black bile. Mm -hmm. stuff yeah. And in the winter, when everything's coldest and there's less innate heat and energy, those blocks really start to show up. And you're moving less, you know, you're not getting as much exactly. exercise probably. Yeah. So as soon as he came back, I gave him the spring tonics. I put him on nettle, I, nettle juice, cleavers juice that I freeze. And, uh, you know, I go and juice it, freeze it in ice cubes and then give that as a medicine. Mm -hmm. And so I gave him that. And also, again, brought back in some of those lovely spring herbs, again, the ones that then work in the cathartic way to actually get it out, out of the blood and, and out of the body. And, and again, it got him to move on again. So that was a lovely example of how the narrative of the humoral oh, cycle cool. yeah. enables you to have a narrative about treating a patient. Mm. Yeah. And that's one of the difficulties we have in biomedicine because you can say, oh no, he's come back again. Well, I didn't, it's not working anymore. What am I going to do? It's right. a different season. And yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, it's it's that whole thing of of, of understanding these we, our patients are nature. What what do we see nature doing? Why is it when nature has these problems and gets stuck? How does it respond to it? And how mm. can we then respond to it? Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense too, because in terms of the the humor humoral system as opposed to like in the the doshas in ayurveda you know you know vata pitta kapha yeah. uh, we have four in in the west and they're also tied to the tropical zodiac because the tropical zodiac is seasonal you know it's based yeah. on equinox yeah. solstices yeah. there's in the vedic it's sidereal it's based on the stars so yeah. it's a but also it, there's less difference in seasons there i mean they have like a monsoon season and so on yeah. But we have in, in the Northern Hemisphere and in, in yeah. Northern yeah, Europe. And in, four. Right. Four distinct seasons. There, yeah. And yeah. they're very the hot. The summer is hot. The winter is cold, especially yeah. in yeah. North America. The summer is really hot and this cold yeah. winter is really yeah. cold. Yeah. So it's a, it, it, I, I'm starting to try to see how these different systems operate better in different lands. Yeah, different yeah they are. Yeah, you know, they are. Environment. I think you're right. You know, they've evolved out of cultures that are embedded in a particular part of the planet right yeah and it may mean that you you can still use you can still transpose them because actually most people now don't live in in the climate of their planet do they, they live in these right boxes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> acclimatized boxes so yeah. but still we're still keyed into the planets keyed into the seasonal cycles the lunar cycles the solar cycles whether we're just in a box the whole time you know we know that as part of our it's been shown now as part of our dna that mm -hmm. this rhythmic cyclical connection is embedded even within our dna and it continues whether you look someone in a dark room or not cycles right. still happen yeah i mean even just the the night and the day you know being in the north just that the difference in the light you, yeah. you still have windows most of the time. You do, exactly. <laughs> you do. And there is a difference in the summer between the length of the days and the winter. You wind. do. Yeah. And people do do manifest that quite clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, this has been a really wonderful conversation, Steve. So interesting. I, yeah. I'm really glad that we got to have this and that you put this book out, The Humoral Herbal, because I think it's it is really important for the revival of this tradition. So is, is there anything that you'd like to share with our listeners before we wrap up? Just get out there and and talk to the plants. Mm. <laughs> yeah. They will talk back. Yes. And you can get the Humoral Herbal from Aeon Books. Yeah. And there, there should be a, a discount code, which we'll put in the description. Right. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, this is this is this is yeah. Really, yeah, really enjoyable talking to you both. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, and, yeah, you never know in the future. Maybe we'll have more inspiring and yeah, enjoyable, enjoyable chats. Yeah, I'd love to do that again. We have so much to talk about. <laughs> yeah, brilliant.